Good morning, Tamika Middleton. It's so good to see you. Good to see you, as always. Um, before I formally introduce you, I wanted to share a little piece uh, from the chapter, Conjuring the Roots of Healing Justice in the Southeast, that you and uh, Kara Page co-authored from the amazing book, Healing Justice Lineages, Dreaming at the Crossroads of Liberation, Collective Care, and Safety. Uh, and we were we were just talking about your home and this really, this speaks to it so much. Memory work is in these trees and bloodlines, fault lines right below the roots of trees that know the secrets of this South and the old South. Our ancestors came, back, came by way of these rivers from Florida to Georgia to North Carolina and South Carolina, touched the same soil and seeded abolition and freedom. Welcome, Tamika. Let me introduce you uh, for folks that I can't imagine that people don't know you, especially in the Southeast. But for anybody that doesn't, um, Tamika Middleton is the managing director of the Women's March. She is an organizer, doula, midwifery apprentice, writer, an unschooling mama who is passionate, uh, passionate about and active in struggles that affect Black women's lives, especially regarding reproductive justice, abolition, and the rights of domestic workers. She is engaged in multiple grassroots organizations in Georgia, including the Metro Atlanta Mutual Aid, MAMA, and the leadership team of Kindred Southern Healing Justice Collective. She serves as a community advisory board member of Critical Resistance and is the treasurer of the Organization for Human Rights and Democracy. Welcome to Mika Middleton. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here with you, Rita. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're really thrilled to have you as part of the um, Public Health Pulse. And uh, do you have anything else you'd like to add about your, your family, your history, any, any additions? Um, as you see, you know, we were talking about before, I'm just getting back to Atlanta from, um, from my family home in South Carolina, St. Helena Island. Um, and so I'm feeling very grounded, <laughs> very grounded today um, and very, very grounded in that tradition. And also just want to name that there is a young person on a FaceTime with her bestie in the next room. So if it gets loud, <laughs> you just flag it and I will ask her to <laughs> bring her voice down. <laughs> That that all works. That that all works. <laughs> and you know, jumping right in, I mean, it's clear that you've been deeply involved in issues of reproductive health and justice from multiple different perspectives. Um, could you talk a little about the roots of reproductive justice coming out of our southern experience mm -hmm. and how that history is really shaping the present landscape of multi-layered assaults on bodily autonomy, especially for black women? Absolutely. I mean, Black women have been in this battle around bodily autonomy as long as we have been on these shores, on this on this soil, in this country, um, beginning uh, with enslavement, um, beginning on, you know, slave ships um, being brought to this country, the very uh, concept that they did not own their bodies um, and that extended not just to labor, but also to reproduction because those things, of course, were tied together. Um, and so we're talking about, when we think about reproductive justice going back all the way then, we're talking about uh, forced, forced breeding. Um, we're talking about um, folks having to fight and take their reproduction into their own hands through the use of midwives and root workers and healers um, that are coming out of the Black community um, who are uh, teaching folks how to use herbs and things that they could access naturally, things that they would they could access, you know, from um, through uh, medicinally that might be used for other means, but what could also help you have an abortion, right? So that is that the, the this, you know, cotton root bark, the indigo, the, all those things that our folks use to be able to manage and, and their own uh, reproduction covertly, right? Um, and so there's this kind of role of midwives and healers and herbalists going all the way back there in, um, in reproductive health and in reproductive, in the reproductive lives of Black women. Um, and then also, we had we couldn't talk about it without talking about 
um, you know, forced sterilization, forced uh, surgeries and procedures on the bodies of enslaved women. You talk about um, the story of Anarcha and J. Marion Sims and all the all the um, the enslaved women who, you know, he had in his backyard um, of his house and was de developing all of these like foundational gynecological and obstetric procedures on their bodies without anesthesia. And so the story of uh, reproductive justice and the fight for reproductive justice in the black, black community in this country goes back as long as we have been here. And so we've continued in that fight um, as you know, the the crackdown and the criminalization of black midwives and black birth workers um, happened not you know not long after enslavement, really in the early 1900s. Um, as um, you know, for so long, black women were not allowed to be and give birth in the same hospital with white folks, and so of course, black midwives had a particular role um, in ma in making sure that that was. Um, that, that, that our babies came into the world. Our babies came into the world safely. Our babies came into the world surrounded by love. I was just watching a video earlier where um, this guy who's a principal, a black man who's a principal at a school, at an elementary school was saying how, you know, wherever we go, we should be, we should be able to be greeted by love. And I think that's the role that like black midwives played um, for our children, for, you know, for our babies as they were coming into this world. And I think the thing around reproductive justice also is, you know, we talk about the kind of definition of reproductive justice as laid out by the original founders, as they were the original creators of, of reproductive justice. They talk about the right to um, to decide, you know, to have a baby or not to have a baby, the right to um, have that baby, you know, in a, in, a, in a safe way, and the right to raise that baby, right, to raise that child. And so, you know, I want to talk about the part to raise that child also as how we tie that to enslavement and the ways in which Black women were not able to control whether or not they got to raise their children um, and the way in which they got to raise their children. They were not necessarily able to nurse their children. Um, and, you know, were those and folks- forced to nurse others' children. Exactly, exactly. And so our reproductive capacities were controlled in every aspect. Um, and then we come out of enslavement and, you know, for many communities, uh, that means coming into, into poverty, into criminalization, into new forms of criminalization. And so, um, you know, the midwives really were holding that down, holding that space, making it possible for, for our folks to, um, to, to have children safely. But also if you are having children and you're wanting to breastfeed, but you don't have enough food. Um, you know, you don't have safe places for them to live. Um, those are the things that the roles that midwives also help to play. Um, but then, you know, you have the, uh, the, the, what is capitalism, right? In this country. So you have <laughs> the introduction. Private property, right? Exactly, exactly. Right. So uh, capitalism is never, is never not a part of the equation. Absolutely. So you have the introduction uh, formula feeding and all these things that, that you know, the demonization of, of, of breastfeeding, you had the demonization, the criminalization of midwifery and the introduction of a number of um, regulations that made it harder, especially for the elder midwives who had been holding down the tradition to be able to practice. Uh, you had the uh, demonization around cleanliness. You know, these Black midwives aren't clean enough, uh, even though midwives had better rates and better results than even those, you know, those obstetricians at the time who did not believe in hand, did not understand hand washing and sterilizing, sterilizing yeah. equipment, et cetera. And so you have this, this fight and this journey around, around that you continue to have, you know, the go, coming up into to now the, um, uh, snatching of, you know, Black women's children, Black women's babies through the foster care system, through the prison industrial complex. Um, you have through, you know, people being impoverished and not having the means to take care of their children. But in this day and age, I think part of our, our we have two major fights that Black women are, are engaged in around reproductive justice. And this is not by any means the extent of the fight, but you have the a big fight around abortion access, um, which if we are really, you know, going to be real about it, why, why reproductive justice is a particular framework that is distinct from reproductive health is that there are particular ways that, that race, um, class, et cetera, immigration status, et cetera, 
play a role that make a distinct um, a, a framework of oppression that um, that has to be taken into account uh, that in order to understand fully um, that there are ways that um, restrictions on reproductive uh, autonomy, on bodily autonomy are distinct for people of color than they are for white folks. And so if you look at, if we, if we go back and we look at midwifery and the demonization of midwifery and the, the introduction of midwifery schools and midwifery qualifications, a lot of that was at the behest of this burgeoning uh, movement of white midwives in the 1970s, um, you know, the 60s and 70s, they were like, we're going back, to, you know, back to the nature and we're going to go back to home birth. And this is the way you have to do it this way uh, in order to be, uh, you know, we're, we're going to, we're developing these schools of midwifery. And it's only, you know, in the past 10 years or so that there are you know, 15 years, maybe that there are uh, schools of midwifery that are launched and led by black women, by black folks, that they are, there has been a push in the past decade plus to ensure that these schools of midwifery are, have cultural competency, basic cultural competency. Um, and there's continuous fights um, around ensuring that schools of midwifery train folks to, um, to care for Black women, for, to care for women of color. And that's tied very directly to the other big fight that we're in, which is around maternal mortality. Black women continue to die in childbirth at much higher rates than anyone else um, in terms of our, um, in terms of rates, not in terms of, you know, um, raw, raw numbers. Um, and it doesn't matter. Yeah. What what class? It doesn't matter what level level of education. Uh, it's still black women who are highly educated and who you know are, are middle class or higher are still dying at higher rates than their than their white counterparts and even even white women who have less education and less money. Um, and so there are all the, these um, particular dynamics and particular and when we think about abortion, particular ways that um, the restrictions on reproductive uh, access impact black women differently. So if we think about you know the fall of Roe which happened last year, um, for, for so many pe people in reproductive justice, the, um, the framework has been Roe was never enough. Roe was the floor and not the ceiling because, because of the Hyde Amendment, there were so many Black folks who did not have access, Black folks in rural communities in the South who did not have access to reproductive health care. And so looking at all of these things holistically, you had um, this gathering of uh, women of color leaders um, who came like yourself, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> well, pre before me, you know, are, are the Loretta Rosses of the world, the um, Able Men Ross, right? Uh, who came together and founded, created this framework um, to think about reproductive health and reproductive health access, um, and and talk and and grounded it in a framework that was not just about reproductive health, but that was also about racial justice. That was also about environmental justice. That was also about economic justice. Um, and so that out of that was born the reproductive justice framework. And of course, we've continued to grow it and continue to add nuance to it. So there's birth justice that's come out of it, healing justice has been informed by reproductive justice and it's you know abortion justice is a is new you know language and framework that folks are, are operating inside of and so all of these things are born out of this moment um i think it's been 30 years maybe uh wherein you know these folks came, these these women of color came together and said what is happening in the reproductive health reproductive rights framework is not does not serve people in our communities we have to create a framework that actually gets to the root causes of you know of, of what is happening, what is taking place in our community, and that addresses those root causes and doesn't just put band-aid solutions that leave black folks, that leave you know Latinx folks, that leave poor folks out, that leave leave us behind as you know white women, uh, uh, you know, and other and, and wealthy women get access to things that these the other folks don't get left behind. Exactly. So that was a, long, a long answer to your question. <laughs> no, no, it was it was absolutely a perfect answer because you raised all of the interconnectedness that the issue of reproductive justice raises right from the get go. Everything about private property and bodies as private property uh, and not ours, not our own, not our own choices uh, about criminalization and the relationship between, you know, the 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 kind of oppression that's been experienced and um an abolition right the the criminal the criminal injustice system and the role of you know on the one hand breeding in order to create humans to be exploited and then on the other hand uh, 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 uh sterilization to eliminate 
uh, so-called undesirable sections of the community that we witnessed, of course, with Irwin County. But you're, mm-hmm. you know, you are constantly on the move. You are constantly uh, not only bringing this message but organizing. And I wonder if you can talk for just a, just another minute about kind of the, the work that you're actually moving now around the scope of this reproductive justice, right? Absolutely. And evolution, right, right. Absolutely. So, I mean, the the bulk of my work currently is really in this fight around reproductive um, re- around abortion access. It's really um, where a lot of my work has has lied over the past year and a half as the clamp down and crackdown um, and the you know stripping away of our rights um, has intensified. Um, especially since I would say the fall, uh, summer fall of 2021, um, where we started to see, uh, you know, not, not really started, but we, we continue to see the, uh, the, the abortion bans, a kind of total of six week abortion bans being passed across the country. And of course, <laughs> the right is very smart. They're very like, we take, we take for granted how smart and how strategic they are. And of course, you know, they were being very strategic in um, violent passing these bills and then knowing they were going to get challenged and, and attempting to to pass them so that they could get those challenges all the way to the Supreme Court so they could ultimately challenge Roe v. Wade, right? Um, and so in the fall of 2021 is when we saw Texas pass SB8, um, which was a new frontier in abortion crackdowns because it took the um, enforcement out of the hands of you know, the the government and put it in the hands of private citizens um, and said, if you know someone who um, who is having an abortion, you can sue them. (laughs) If you know someone who helps someone have an abortion, you can sue them. Uh, And so there's a new frontier in the attempts like the 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 strategy has shifted um, and evolved and gotten sharper and more insidious. Um, But as we're in that work, as we're challenging um, challenging bills like SB8, as we're challenging um, you know attempts to 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 not just um, make it harder for people to have uh, surgical abortions, but to make it harder for people to have medical uh, medical abortions, medication right. abortions yeah. as well. Um, what we're seeing, we're it's uncovering the ways in which the right is so is so tricky and so sneaky. <laughs> uh, the ways in which they have over many years said, "Hey, you know what? All of these things that we want to, all these rights we want to take away ultimately they're going to come to the courts so what we should do is spend the next several years really packing those courts exactly right? exactly horrific <laughs> exactly we're going to put our people where we want them to be That's and where they can you know and then we're going to very very uh strategically target just those those courts we're going to file out and start our organizations in the district where those courts are that are run by our judges so that we can get the the you know the legal uh precedents that we want packed and so it's very insidious and and we're seeing that and so what I what I want to talk about and, and connect it to the question of my abolition is that all this is so it's it is specific but it is also broad right because we cannot take um separate this fight around abortion access from the fight around trans rights that we're right. seeing in schools everywhere. And we cannot separate it from the fights we see around um, <clears throat> around book bans and the fights we see around at access to education and the fights we see around, you know, all of these things are connected, the fights we see around voting access, right? They're all connected to this bigger, broader rise of fascism um, in this yeah. country. And we cannot talk about reproductive justice without talking about this bigger, broader rise of fascism that's happening in this country and the way in which the attempt, what we are seeing, if we if we look more broad, if we, if we zoom out, what okay. we are seeing is actually a larger attempt to strip away the rights of marginalized groups, be that women, be that LGBTQ folks, be that black and brown folks. And, to, and, and in doing that, the suppression of dissent um, and the criminalization of dissent. So we see what we see in Florida with making it, um, trying to make it illegal to protest at the Capitol, <laughs> to, to, you know, to protest. Um, well, on even public- here in Georgia, I mean, the way they have encircled, you know, exactly. I remember back in the day, you could actually have a demonstration in front of the Capitol. Yep. Now there's a big uh, metal railing and you have to go to some park across yep. the street where nobody that's can- down, that's like, in, that's recessed, so you can't be seen from the street. <laughs> this whole, it's this whole 
step by step process mm -hmm. of actually legalizing yep. the development of fascism and exactly. the South as an anchor for that. Yeah, exactly. And we can't talk about that without talking about Cop City and talking right. about the domestic terrorism charges that have been brought against about, uh, against folks that 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 uh, are without talking about the young folks who were flyering in Barso County um, about the person, the people who the cop who murdered um, Tortiquita at, at Cop City. And then now they're facing 20 years for intimidation of an officer for passing out flyers. And so I and so I for me, that's connected also to um, a le legislators in the legislators in Nashville who were expelled from right. um, from office for standing with folks who are protesting against gun violence. And it, it is connected to, um, you know, Zoe Zephyr in, I think, uh, Montana, who was expelled from the, you know, who, or it wasn't even expelled, who was muted effectively. And had to go into a separate room. A separate this room. Trans, uh, an elected, uh, openly trans person who was forced to participate in the legislature as an elected official in a separate room. Now, if mm -hmm. that isn't Mm -hmm. And um, they connected to the legislators in, I think, Nebraska, um, who filibustered the whole legislative session around, um, you know, to stop the anti-trans legislation. And then, you know, were able to defeat a, a six-week abortion ban. But then they took that six-week abortion ban and tacked it on the anti-trans legislation so they, they could pass it without having the, um, the blowback. That they were having else, you know, on 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 just the six week abortion ban by itself, and so eventually they silenced those folks. They they refused to call on those protesters, uh, excuse me, on those legislators who were standing in protest, um, in defiance and in, in representing their constituents. And so there is this bigger arc that we have to be thinking about that is about fascism broadly. And so that is the work that I am engaged in now, um, <laughs> bringing it back to the question. <laughs> That yeah. is the, work, the work that I'm engaged in now, um, I'm really excited, actually. We're about to, Women's March is about to launch um, a, a bus tour through the South to, um, to talk to folks in different communities about the ways in which not just that fascism is rearing its ugly head, but the ways in which our folks continue to resist and continue to fight back um, and to, you know, to, to make sure that we are marking the ways in which we continue to be the resistance, you know, the, the resistance against these things in the way in which we continue to stand, even in the face of this repression, even in the face of the criminalization of dissent. You know, and I, I wanted to ask you because because you are talking about, you know, the response, the resistance, the engagement against the challenging, the constant constant fight back that people are actually waging. I also wanted you to to take, you know, as you as you so beautifully articulated this nightmarish landscape, by definition, you have a vision in your mind of mm. the kind of landscape that we should have, that mm. we could have, that is absolutely necessary now because of all the connections that you made between climate crisis, abolition, the uh, white supremacist pillar of capitalism that defeats our class all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And we're not going to let that happen again. So, you know, because we're at we're at a nodal point, and we can make that leap. and And I want to hear what you think about that. What your vision of that of that leap to another way of being could actually look like? Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm an abolitionist at my core. <laughs> that was the uh, the framework in which I entered into the movement was through abolition. Um, and so, you know, one of the first, like one of the, the first quotes that I ever like memorized in the movement and that I still like lean on is that, you know, the Angela Davis quote where she says, radical means from the root. Right. And I think that what we, we have to engage in radical transformation in this country. There is no reform our way out. Right. <laughs> I, it is impossible it is impossible because of the climate of this country. And I think we've known it's been impossible for as long as I've been involved in movement. People have been like, it's not possible. <laughs> and I know going farther back, but I think the climate in this country right now makes it so much more evident. It becomes so much more clear, so much more real that there is no way to negotiate. <laughs> there is no there is no reforming our way out of the crisis that we're in right now um, when they are telling our babies they can't read books, right? When, <laughs> when they are banning the uh, the inaugural Amanda Gorman's inaugural uh, inauguration poem from elementary schools, right? Because they, you know, they say it teaches them hate, 
right? Um, there is no reforming our way out of this moment. And so for me, I think there is a, um, I think we have to, I think that we have to organize our way out of this, <laughs> out of this moment. Um, but I do envision, you know, um, that Asada, um, Asada Shakur said, um, a wall is just a wall and nothing more as more at all. It can be um, torn down. And so I, that is a, the, the, the way in which I think about this is like the way in which we say there, there what there once was a world without prisons, critical resistance. There once was a world without prisons that day will come again. <laughs> um, and so that's the way I think about it. There once was a world in which we did not live like this. This that's was true. not the way we always lived, that's right? True. There once was a world in which we did not have prisons. We have to relearn how we lived without relying on prisons, without relying on police. There once was a world in which we had access to the things that we needed. Now, with, with the technology that we have, like we can't go backwards, right? We can't go backwards and say, we're going That's to right. turn That's to right. the, you know, because we have all of this knowledge, we have all of this technology, the world has changed, but we can look back to learn some things and bring them forward. And I think that has been a big part of how I view my own role in the work um, as both like, hey, I know my people have traditions around herbalism and around birth work. Let me learn those things and bring them forward. Um, but also, I know my people have some lessons around resistance and I know they learn some things. I know that there's some things that they tried and they didn't work. <laughs> let's not let's not do those again. <laughs> um, and so I think I can envision a world in which for me, in which ch my children and my children's children are free. And I think part of, you know, part of how I parent um, and why I, I'm always very explicit in saying, no, I, I'm an unschooling mama that is a part of my political bio bi biography is because I think of my parenting as a part of my politic, as a part of my activism, as a part of my organizing work, because I have worked very hard to create a, a world in, inside of our home which in my, where in my children know what freedom feels like. And so when they go out into the world, they know what freedom does not feel like. And they can challenge that when they feel it. And they challenge it in our house. They say, uh-uh, mom, <laughs> hold up. This is what you're saying does not, I, I don't like that. That's, you're making a decision for me, mom, and I don't like it. I'm like, okay, bet. <laughs> and so I think part of what, for me, part of the work is not just challenging the fascism as it, as it arises, but also practicing being in freedom. Yeah. Also practicing and, and building in our communities right now, what is a world in which we do not rely on an oppressive fascist government, where we can practice what governance feels like in our own communities, what equitable government governance feel like in our communities. And that's not to say that everybody has to agree. I don't believe that we're all that we all have to agree. We all have to have the same um, political uh, exact political framework that we're operating out of. But we should but we have to practice being in dialogue in a way that we can govern ourselves and our communities. And we have to practice it every day. So that um, what I what I always I always joke with folks, I'm like, you know, we fighting for freedom, but when we get to freedom, we're gonna hate each other. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, I don't want us to hate each other when we get to the other side. So That's, how right. Can, That's right. So how can we practice the kind of care, the kind of dialogue, the kind of governance, the kind of freedom? Um, that we are trying to build so that when we get to the up to when we get to that thing, when we tear down these structures, we have something in its place. Because a problem often, and you know, Rita, you're you're much you're much more read and studied than I am. Like you, uh, you read you read more than I do. But my <laughs> look, we learn together. It's all yeah. of it. It's all of it. <laughs> but my my understanding of of often what will happen in revolution is that we will know what we are fighting against, but we will not be clear and prepared to, to uh, implement what we are fighting for. And so there will be a moment wherein there is a vacuum and often neoliberals, often neocolonialists, often fascists will st step into that vacuum. And we can, and, and I know for me, we have to be prepared to not allow that thing to happen. And so I definitely dream of a world in which Black women are not dying when we give birth, that we're, we're in birth is a beautiful, transformative community building experience. Um, I envision a world in which when, you know, our people are taken care of, they have what they need, and then when harm happens, because inevitably harm happens, right? You know, we, we don't always intend to harm each other, but that when harm happens, we remember that we care for each other, That's that right. we love each other That's and true. that we care for each other through the harm. Um, 
And I envision a world where our children have access to all the knowledge and they can make decisions and they can come to their own um, understandings of the world through access to knowledge and through dialogue, intergenerational conversation, intergenerational dialogue, learning from each other, wherein I can be in a conversation with you, Rita. I can be in a conversation with, you know, our folks in uh, folks on, on the um, continental African. I can be in conversation with our folks in Puerto Rico and we can build um, a, a collective understanding and analysis of the world and a collective understanding of how we want to be together in the world in that way. And we're not throwing each other in cages and we're not throwing each other away. And we're not denying each other access to the to healthcare that they need. I was reading a, um, a post from New, um, New York Times Magazine about Vienna and they were talking about social housing and how 80 something percent of all of their folks are in social housing um, in Vienna and uh, and so because they're um, in social housing, it keeps the cost of housing down for everybody because the most people are in this government subsidized housing. Um, and it's just I'm like, oh, you know, can we make sure that our people have places to live? Right. Like That's basic right. things. I think I think that the world that I dream of is not that radical. It's ba- is very basic at the, at the core of it. It feels radical because it's so far from what we have now. But it's That's actually so much what we need. Uh, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Finish your <laughs> sentence. No, no, no. That's the, vi- I mean, we need to have that conversation about vision. I think you articulated it absolutely magnificently for humanity to actually finally become fully human. Right. <laughs> On the basis of love, collectivity, collaboration, care, Um and that we can all bring what it is we bring. Like we can all bring our own special sauce to what that is and be respected for whatever that special sauce is and be honored and loved for whatever that is, you know? Like I think about um, Octavia Butler is, uh, in the Parable series. I actually dreamt about that series last night. <laughs> but, uh, in the Parable series, you know, they, they are building towards this, this community they call Wild Seed. And so when I'm facilitating, I'm always asking our folks, I'm like, what are you bringing to Wild Seed? Both in terms of stuff, like what do you feel is necessary? But what are your skills? What are your talents that you will bring, that you're bringing into like this intentional world that we're trying to build, this model community, this vision of a new world? What are you bringing? What is your special sauce that you want to bring to that space? And so I love to be in conversation and dialogue with folks about that because often because of capitalism, what we are bringing to the world is not necessarily our special selves. Yeah. <laughs> we are doing the things that we need. Because we live doing. under it, you know, exactly. we're bombarded we to... every day, you know, by. Exactly. And we do our best, right? We do our best to resist within it. But it is the reality that we have to feed ourselves and clothe ourselves and house ourselves. And so we are subjected to the system of capitalism. But I would, I love to be in conversation with folks about what would you want if, in the world, what is your thing that you know you bring and that you would love to bring into the world? And for me, I'm like, I'm going to be helping to birth the babies. <laughs> I'm going to be foraging. I want to be sewing some clothes. Those I'm like that. <laughs> those are, I don't want to do that for money in this world. That's but right. those, are th- <laughs> those are things that I want to do that I want to bring into that, you know, into that next, into that vision, into that future. And I think we sometimes struggle with that because we are so used to thinking about what are the things we can do for money? What is our hustle? What is our, how are we going to survive? And, um, and I think, you know, we're so often, we're so often visioning to the other side of this struggle. You know what I'm saying? The particular struggle that we're in. What is the thing we're trying to get in the, the on the other side of this struggle that is so hard for us to envision past? Like what? What is it? What is it going to feel like? What is it going to look like? What is it going to smell and taste like when we're when is when we pass the struggles? You know, and so that's 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 the vision I try. That's what I try when I'm facilitating. I try to push people to that place. I'm like, I, I, we had this um, in my, my consulting work. We had we working with a group in um, they were a group that worked around sexual violence. And so we're like, what's the vision? What's the what's your what's the vision for your organization? And they were like, there's less sexual violence. We're like, that's your vision? You don't yeah. want to envision the world like. You just like keep constantly fighting against, and they're like, "Oh, okay." And we're like, "Yeah, vision past. Can we vision past sexual violence? Is that a, is that a possibility? What would that take if we stretch ourselves and vision past sexual violence? Then we can build a strategy that takes us there. But if we can only vision to less sexual violence, then we can only build a strategy that takes us to that point. If uh, we can't vision to it, we can't figure out how to get there. And so the, that's the that's difference the between reform and revolutionary transformation. Uh, yeah. That part. That and I'll be in your workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Jamika, we could go. I mean, I could I could listen to you for the next 
for the entire afternoon. <laughs> I am so grateful for your sharing all of this, the, the the amazing amount of your work, but also this push for the vision of another way of being, uh, yeah. of, of another world is possible, really, and necessary now, uh, and that we can do it. And I just I just want to thank you so much for being a